Good morning, friends. Good morning to this morning's uh, monthly. Uh, we are here to discuss an important issue, uh, which actually we don't discuss much in the open, but I think that it uh, it needs a discussion from. Good morning, friends. Uh, Good morning from an expert. This morning's uh, uh, monthly needs a discussion from an expert, and we have Siddharth speaking to us. Uh, the we are we are going to have a discussion on India's seafood industry boon or bane. Siddharth has a uh, life in the ocean, if I can say that. Uh, he spent his entire adult life working in the merchant navy in various capacities. He was he captained activist ships in Antarctica. He investigated human rights abuses in fishing industry. Uh, he is currently pursuing a PhD in uh, London uh, that grapples with the social and economic sustainability of India's seafood production. Uh, I think that uh, while while he was had a very active career in the life in the oceans, from what I can read about him, he had a very troubled career also. He was really troubled about what we are doing to the oceans, and uh, and right now is more concerned about the global degradation of our oceans, more so in India. Uh, welcome, Siddharth. Thank you for being with us. And uh, we hope we have a good month and we'll be discussing with you many issues which are likely to bring up. Thank you, and you can start. Thanks, uh, Vikram, so much. And thanks to everyone at uh, Manthan. Um, welcome, and uh, thank you for coming really on a Sunday morning to talk about fish and seafood. Um, it's 5 a.m. here in London, and hopefully as the day comes up, uh, you know, there's some dynamic changes. Otherwise, the, the presentation is pretty chart heavy. Um, and thanks, Vikram. I just wanted to say that, you know, the present presentation is going to be focused in India, an area of work that I've been involved with now for about six years. Um, and the larger kind of ocean work and global macroeconomy of fisheries goes back a little bit further to about 10, 11 years of work. But India is distinct in the sense of its fishing industry. And so I've restricted the global dimension to maybe come back in the Q&A and the discussion to try and kind of map those linkages about where we are at. Um, and I also wanted to say that, you know, I come in here to speak really in the spirit of curiosity and to foster discussion. Um, I think the audience really represents a lot of accomplishment and experience. And I think it would be a mistake from my side to not engage uh, with all of you and learn more just to enrich my own work, but also what's happening in the sector. Um, I also want to make a disclaimer that, you know, the presentation does not present a definitive seafood history of India. Um, using the unions and the collectives that I work with, it offers one lens into examining uh, where we are at with things. Um, so I'm indebted to people who have spent time with me and brought me this understanding that I can share with all of you. Um, and so I'm just going to share my screen and, and get started. Um, um, so you can see the presentation here, yeah, Vikram? Just yeah. To go, yeah, okay. So, you know, uh, over the next 40 minutes, uh, I'm going to try and walk through a summarized post-independence history of seafood production in India. Um, I hope that in the process and in our chat app, after we can discuss a response to the question that the presentation is focused around, is seafood development in India a boon or bane? Um, I would like to draw attention to the fact that it's perhaps extremely hard or even limiting or maybe erroneous to restrict the understanding of fisheries within the borders of the nation state. Um, as a country that is a part of the subcontinent, fisheries as we understand them today are a very recent manifestation of a particular ordering um, of the world, one based largely on the competition between and within nation states. Um, for fish that live mobile lives through migrations in dynamic ecosystems, the bigger picture on the future of the seafood, especially in the age of extinction and the climate crisis, must be attempted to be reframed within the larger picture of the subcontinent. And, you know, as this image tries to show us, um, India's coasts are mere borders to an ocean that, while at the surface might seem flat and horizontal, under their depths hold a world of mountains and crevices, currents and upwelling and migration and movement. Um, likewise, the rivers in the north originate and flow between and into nation states, 
a testimony to the shared ecology of the region. The monsoon winds, the mangrove forests of the Sundarbans, and the crisscrossing of rivers um, across borders shape fisheries, shape fisher people's lives, and kind of the interactions between people and the oceans. Um, now, seafood production in India is divided into four broad sectors. You have the marine fisheries sector, you have the freshwater fisheries sector, the brackish water, and the cold fisheries sector. Uh, now, marine water requires uh, implies really the sea. Uh, freshwater is a wide, diverse range of ecosystems from rivers, lakes, dams, ponds, reservoirs. Uh, brackish water is a mix of saline and marine water. So you can think about Pulikat and Chilika lakes, but also now increasingly a lot of the coastal lands, uh, which are in, uh, in, in saline kind of uh, areas where tidal influences are present. Um, and cold water fisheries are usually higher altitude, snow-fed lakes and rivers, and are largely restricted to the northern ranges of the country. Now, seafood production in each of these sectors have a component. Uh, one is capture fisheries, where fish are caught in fishing nets, either by following the fish in a fishing boat or setting up gears for fish to come to the nets. Um, and the second is culture fisheries, um, where arrangements are made to restrict the movement of fish and for them to be farmed through a combination of techniques. Uh, now, traditionally, each of these sectors has seen a combination of capture and culture fisheries. Um, in co the coastal states of Kerala and West Bengal, for example, um, it was quite common for fish to be caught in the sea and for fish to be grown alongside in rice fields or for homesteads to have ponds that are stocked each monsoon for fish to be grown through the year. Likewise, the Sundarbans and other lakes have gheris or bheris, kind of enclosures that allow for fish to be trapped and grown within confined spaces. And this has existed alongside the presence of boats and nets to capture fish. Now, these practices continue, uh, though more and more marginal. Uh, what we're interested in in this presentation is the broad trends in seafood production. And I want to just highlight two trends that we see here. Uh, the first one, as you see, uh, is represented in this image. It shows that fisheries have shifted from one sector to the other. So for, as I spoke about the four ecologies, um, you know, there's been a shift in policies in each one of these that have made seafood production kind of shift geographically from one sector to the other. Um, and what has also happened that each of those sectors um, have seen an expansion of that kind of fishing in particular phases. So if you see this kind of image that is in front of you, it shows the mapping of marine fishing boats. Um, and the blue that you see is India's exclusive economic zone. And you can see, you know, there's significant overlaps between the states. There's also this movement outwards. So that's kind of one trend. And the second trend that I want to talk about is that, you know, we've shifted from capture fisheries to culture fisheries. And in that process, we've kind of intensified how we produce fish as well. And so, for example, what this graph tries to show, you know, it maps shrimp production in India over a three decade period. Um, if you look at the blue, that is one species. It's the black uh, tiger prawn. Um, and if you look at the orange one, that's a Pacific white shrimp that's come in from Latin America into India over the last 15 years. And you can see that, you know, there's a steady production. And then suddenly there's an intensification in production where there's the skyrocketing or booms that happen. Um, and so these booms have been something that have been um, kind of characterized as these ecologies have shifted as well. Um, and I'm going to use these two trends, kind of the geographical expansion and this technological intensification to kind of look at an increase in seafood production and its kind of continuous change in ecology, in the methods, in the species that are produced, and with it, how it correlates to a corresponding change in markets, regions, and actors who participate in the process. Um, now, the pillar of kind of post independence fisheries uh, came in the first few decades from the marine fishery sector. In 1954, India signed a tripartite agreement with Norway and the United Nations for the transfer of technology. Um, this included a boat design, a uh, design known as trawlers, and the shoreside administrative and management expertise. This kick-started the mechanization of Indian fisheries, a direction and policy that continues to influence the trajectory of development. 
the program initially started off the southwest of coast, uh, the southwest coast of India in Kerala, and then expanded to other parts of the country. First, kind of northwards along the same coast to Gujarat and Maharashtra, and then later coming up to the year 2000 along the east coast of India, particularly in West Bengal. Now, as the figure on the left shows, um, there's a lot of blue uh, in the 1950s, um, which shows that the concentration of fishing pressure, which is the red, higher present, it's really close to shore. And then three years, three decades later, you see kind of the coast of Gujarat, Maharashtra, uh, Kerala particularly, the kind of red expansion has moved outwards uh, more than the figure on the left. But you still see that on the east coast, it's less. And if we were to look at that image today, the, almost everything that's yellow and blue is today red. So that's that first trend that happened of moving outwards. Um, now, this policy that was introduced in 1954 was introduced as a deep sea fishing policy that was meant to target species that were beyond existing fishing grounds of traditional and small scale fishers. Um, however, the technical nature of the policy came to interact with the socio ecology, and boats began adapting to indigenous gears and designs. And at that point in time, there was also a huge export market for prawns, something that has been dubbed very often the pink rush um, to talk about the amount of foreign exchange that it brought in. And with this, uh, a lot of the boats kind of moved away from deep sea and closer to shore, um, looking for prawns as they migrated from the coastal regions out to sea, where it was kind of more productive to be able to catch them. Um, and this gave rise to conflict with traditional fishers and also a lot of juvenile shrimp began to be targeted before they could grow their entire cycle. Uh, by the middle of the 1970s, just two decades after this policy, India had already become the biggest producer of prawns. Um, but research shows that as early as in 1974, in fact, there's a report from the Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute that uh, the resource was already under stress. And this changed the policy in two ways. Um, so the first policy we see is that we begin to see a diversification from about 1975 onwards at sea. Um, this implies not just a geographical expansion, but also now taking trawlers and they're becoming an intensification in the kind of boats and gears that are available. Um, so as you see, again, this leads to more competition in the same area of the ocean. If you see the image on the left here, you know, you, you, it, it, it's mapped from 1950 to about 2015. And sometime around 1970, you see that, you know, the trawlers, which is the orange band, begins to have a green band. And then, you know, over the years, the quantity and the thickness of each of those brands begin to increase. And from the 1990, all other combination of smaller gears, the, the dark blue, kind of level off, and the width of all the other gears begin to take off. Um, and that's also represented on the right here, where there's conflict um, in response to the mechanization. And then you have the diversification of gears, but also then you have the motorization of small crafts. And so, you know, the small scale sector, which is non-motorized, that doesn't use engines to propel, that uses a lot of labor, gets completely wiped out. Um, today, they catch less than 2% of India's catch. Uh, but the mechanized boat continues to grow, where today it accounts for about 80% of the catch. And then you have a large chunk of about uh, maybe 60 to 70% of the boats catching about 20% of the catch. So there's a lot of gears and there's a lot of competition that kind of enters the second stage within the same ocean space. Um, now, there is also a dimension here of India's attempts to open up its waters um, starting in the 1970s. Uh, when something known as the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, the UNCLOS, declared the exclusive economic zones and India claimed 200 nautical miles of sea. Um, and then the imperative under UNCLOS was to kind of harvest the economic rent that was available from these fisheries. And so with liberalization policies, there was an attempt for foreign fleets. We had some boats from Tuna and other arrangements written in, but I'm not going to go into that too much. Uh, because it's kind of got a distinct history. But just so we know that, you know, there was a strong fishers movement in the 1990s, which kind of has always thwarted this process to be able to liberalize the ocean fully. And as of 2017, actually, the Indian government has rescinded 
uh, the licenses of all fishing boats and so no foreign fishing vessels currently fish in india's waters um but in spite of all of these attempts um from the 90s onwards uh, catch landings to marine fisheries have largely remained stagnant uh, even though there has been an immense shift in the composition of species landed so you know we don't have the big prawns but it shifted to something else it shifted to the sardines it shifted to group to other kind of species um uh, and and there's been a huge shift of catch composition between mechanized motorized and non motorized boats in terms of how many boats catch what um uh, so the there's not been an increase in 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 the amount of fish that has been landed just a change in composition and a change in scale of what is caught by each sector um uh, but today it's well known that the waters up to the continental shelf of india do not offer any scope for further growth and this has led to the shift in seafood in another way um the first of this is the shift that has come in brackish water fisheries so for example um by the 1970s the main revenue generator from the prawn exports had begun to decline and this began to prompt a shift to different forms of development on land um through multilateral initiatives the importing of feed technologies and developing indigenous prawn farming techniques the focus really shifted to growing prawn on land as opposed to relying on erratic and diminishing returns from the at sea prawn stocks um as the graph on the left indicates um the period from 1985 shows how the rise in cultured prawns the gray columns become more and more in sync with the yellow and brown columns uh, indicating that farm shrimp come to be tied increasing to the export quantity and value of shrimp um today almost half of all seafood export from india um comes the revenue generation comes from one single shrimp species um if you remember the earlier slide that's the orange one uh and it totals to about 30000 crores a year in revenue um what was also significant about uh, the ships was that areas that were traditional sites of prawn production like kerala of west bengal did not really balloon into major hubs instead andhra pradesh and tamil nadu became the epicenters of indian shrimp production um, i would think people at manthan given their location close to andhra pradesh um, and historically kind of also being the epicenter of trade in the region uh, shrimp has been a big part of and seafood has been a big part of the state's history so this is a well known uh, information for all of you and you know andhra pradesh produces about 70% of india's single that single species alone um and so as you can see with the image on the right um there's a difference between production and processing and exports so while a lot of production happens on the east coast a lot of processing and exports happen along the west coast not very clearly demarcated but this you know also overlaps with uh capture and culture fisheries um but kind of this image shows that you know production of fisheries have become delinked a little bit at least for prawn from conditions and sea and have become tied to more political economic and ecological conditions on land um the west coast which if you recall is where the prawn rush had started has obviously been overtaken and left behind by the eastern coast states um the reasons for this um are of course tied to policies and economic policies at the regional state level but i think the most obvious um is that these are it's tied to the ecological conditions of land the estuarine regions of the east coast the the depth of the continental shelf on the east coast um are are hugely facilitating for shrimp farming now farm shrimp requires the regular ingress and egress of saline water um and require plots of land that can be dug up to act as ponds and these are most readily available along the east coast and for anyone who's been along the east coast of india waters around the rivers and estuaries uh, like the eastern godavari districts or the krishna and guntur districts of andhra pradesh which used to be the former rice baskets have become kind of prominent sites of shrimp production now while the initial phase of shrimp farming was based on the indigenous indian prawn species uh, mainly black tiger prawns a uh, disease risk the use of antibiotics due to intense stocking and american trade measures never really allowed for a large scale expansion of this um however in 2009 a shift to a species imported from the eastern pacific ocean the pacific white shrimp has caused productivity to skyrocket 
making India one of the world's largest shrimp producers. Uh, while there are disease risks growing with the reliance on this monoculture species, various adaptations are being undertaken in the hope that India can continue to ride this boom. Um, now, the second kind of diversification comes in the form of freshwater fisheries. Um, it doesn't, alongside the introduction of trawlers at sea in the 1950s, um, India's agricultural policies, as early as in the 1950s, in fact, even before mechanization, uh, government-funded central institutions had been established to develop inland freshwater fisheries. Now, this sector has two components. One is the stocking of water bodies with fingerlings that grow to maturity in large confined water bodies like reservoirs and lakes. And once they are grown to market size, they are caught and landed for sale. The second is the farming of fish in ponds. Uh, places like West Bengal have done this traditionally. And the move was to kind of expand this commercially into other regions. Uh, but a few steps were needed. And this is where the central institutes really came in um, with their years and decades of kind of, uh, you know, in the 1930s in itself, they were attempting this technology for artificial breeding. In 1950, they were able to do the first trial experiments. Um, and the idea was really taking wild caught sh sh uh, fish and trying to have them spawn in lab conditions to be able to have hatcheries, um, to be able to supply kind of uh, uh, smaller fish for, for being stocked in ponds and being grown. And then alongside this, uh, actually, you needed hatcheries to breed fish, you need the provisioning of feed, and you needed training and institutional finance. All of this kind of was being experimented with and researched. And in the 1970s, uh, induced spawning became really successful, and this gave a rise to the impetus of fish farming. Um, the other major development that happened in the 1970s was the mixed farming of fish species. Now, the most common combinations are either growing major carps, so rohu, katla, and mrigal together, or in addition to growing these, there was the introduction of exotic carps, which are the silver, glass, and common carps. They experimented with the Chinese carps that didn't work out. Then, you know, there's Thai and Indonesian carps that came together. So in most of the ponds today, you grow fish in the six fish combinations. And because they kind of occupy different ecological niches in the same water body, they do not compete at the same water level or for the same feed. And as you can see, this mixed farming along with the induced spawning in the 1980s really, again, caused this uptick. And as the chart on the left shows, you know, the, the, the gray kind of uh, graph, which is freshwater fish, begins to rise in the 80s. And then from 2000, 2001, um, really begins to take off. And that's the time when this technology gets implemented in many parts of the country. Um, the expansion of these forms of uh, fish farming with more efficient feed and seed provisioning, better institutional support and finance arrangement have spiked this productivity in the last two decades. Um, today, freshwater fish produces about three times the fish compared to marine water fish, while at the same time being about 40% cheaper, available almost all year round, and largely deploying uh, less intensive farming techniques, at least in comparison to the shrimp that we saw early. Um, however, this is changing. The ever-growing pressure on fish as a source of cheap protein and vital nutrition is shifting the production to more intensive means. For example, in some of the farms that we visited in West Bengal, uh, shared ownership means that farms can sometimes be as large as 300 acres. Uh, more recently, under new fisheries plans, there are policies to bring large reservoirs and dams under this form of development using cages and pens, and the country is likely to continue to see a sh growing share of freshwater species. And as the graph on the right shows, um, just three species of Indian carps, Rohu, Katla, and Rigal, account for about 56 lakh tons, which is about 57% of the fish that is produced in India currently. Um, and, you know, buoyed by what has been happening since 1947, uh, almost every document that you see related to fisheries development is focused on this growth story. The stories of booms, the rates of growth, the export figures, and the scope that this offers. Uh, even today, uh, you'll continue to see the use of the word sunrise sector. 
And it's kind of considered the sunrise sector because it's growing at about 10.87% since 2014-15, which act not only in India, it's kind of one of the fastest growing food sectors in the world. Um, and over this decade, India is expected to undertake the largest share of expansion of seafood production um, in the world. And if by 2030, this expansion, which is well on track, continues, uh, we'd be producing kind of a sixth of the world's fish, only second to China, uh, and way ahead of a lot of other countries taken together. Um, so where is this growth coming from? Well, marine fisheries, um, there continues to this be this push of deep sea fisheries are moving outwards. So we haven't been able to tap into, uh, in the terms of the documents, the tuna fleets, but you know, also science keeps up with uh, ecological decline. So now there is a revision of the amount of fish that is available in sea, something known as the maximum sustainable yield. It's gone up from about 4 million tons to 5.3 uh, million tons for deep sea resources, squid resources, tuna resources. Um, you've got inland, as I just spoke before, where there's almost a doubling of seafood production that is going to happen. Um, you've got brackish water fisheries, which there is estimated to be about six times the amount of land, with more coming from the green revolution kind of exhausted soils in Haryana and Punjab. And you've got kind of sea mariculture, which is the farming of fish in the sea, which globally and in India is estimated to be a big rising sector. Um, and then you have a niche kind of market for exposed based production in fish such as salmon and trout, which are being grown and developed in the cold water fisheries. Um, and so in, in, in total, just to end this part of the presentation, uh, there is continuing to be an ongoing expansion and intensification uh, outwards in marine fisheries, an expansion into new geographies of brackish water and freshwater fisheries, and the development of cold water fisheries and mariculture. Now, while blue revolutions have been a part of the Indian fishery stories, each of these blue revolutions were kind of related to one fishery sector. But it seems that this time around, um, the revolution is not sectoral, but all encompassing. And every single water body in the country today is under some form of seafood development. And so I think it's important for us to really think about, in the face of this growth, um, it's pertinent to examine what has been the social and environmental impact of this form of development. Uh, it's also pertinent to place this in the current scenario of the ecological and the climate crisis, and to ask really of what we need these water bodies to be as, if we are to avert the crisis, we seem to be hurtling towards at an alarming pace. Um, so I'll briefly run through each one of these sectors. Um, the marine fisheries sector today is characterized by a share of landings that are increasingly concentrated in the mechanized fishing sector. And as this image again shows, about 80% of the catch is taken by 25% of the boat of which trawlers, which were popularized in the 1960s, still account for half the catch. Now, the problem with trawlers is that they were developed as a cold water, North Sea fishery. And while they were destructive here as well, they were definitely not suitable for a mixed species, tropical kind of fishery like in India, where their indiscriminate use, uh, just by the nature of the fishing, you can't drag a net on the bottom of the ocean floor and expect it to catch only one species for you. Um, and this has led to an immense amount of ecological decline. Um, and uh, also with this changing shift and concentration, um, this has led to a squeeze in the amount of catch that is available for smaller boats. And also the use of mechanization has caused a decline in the amount and the quality of fish that is available to them. Now, this situation is constantly evolving, but I think the chart on the right kind of sums up the current situation. The mechanized fishing sector is characterized, characterized in terms of its labor relations by a pattern of migration that is largely from the east coast of India, particularly the states of Andhra Pradesh, Odisha, and West Bengal, to the west coast of India. Now, a way to understand this is to recollect that the west coast of India saw the initial wave of mechanization 
a boom, then a bust, a diversification, and then a cycle of kind of the spatial expansion and intensification. A core feature of fishing is that the ratio between fishing days and steaming days um, is vital to be able to maintain profitability. The further you go away from land, the more kind of diverse and dispersed species you begin to target, the more your profitability gets squeezed. And this leads and has led to a change in work composition, uh, which has led to a demand for workers who are not local and are tied to cheaper wage relations. So on the East Coast, for example, as that mechanized fishing expanded three decades later, uh, fishing operators with small crafts have been squeezed out and have tended to be migrating. Now, this out-migration uh, kind of explains the supply side of the workforce, where if, the chart, if you see the chart, most of the migration is from the coastal areas on the East Coast across to the coastal areas on the East Coast. Now, this unique situation, supply and demand are both outcomes of the same set of policies of the Indian state. Another measurement that can be used to explain this that in the last publicly available census of marine fishers, which is now 12 years old, we do not have publicly available data of this kind uh, anymore. But that data in 2010 showed that 60% of the marine fisher population uh, live below the poverty line, a percentage that is far higher than the national average. Um, in turn, what this represents is also a continued pressure on the ecology, where today low value fish are fast becoming the most common landings for mechanized fishing. This is reflected in both the low value that is generated in the returns to fishing, since the fish only act as cheap inputs to the poultry and other fish sectors, and the fact that the staple fish prices have inflated, further leading to a cycle where people who are most nutritionally reliant on marine fisheries for a source of food are being rendered most vulnerable. Uh, Anybody, again, who lives away from the coastline and is most familiar with the species of, you know, pomfrets, um, sear fish, barracudas, mackerel, you know, you would have known that prices have increased significantly, where in comparison, fish like rohu, katla, mrigal are not only available for much cheaper, but they're also available everywhere. For example, like I come from Nasik. And we only used to get marine fish when I was growing up from Bombay. Uh, and today, you know, you walk, you go across the city and there are freshwater fish stalls everywhere. So I'm sure like people have begun to observe this as well, that marine fish is becoming more expensive. And for people who rely on this fish as a primary source of food, that inflation and its availability has really begun to kind of reflect in a lot of ways in their household food composition and also household income levels related to uh, purchasing food. Um, now, a lot of people, uh, I, I, for me at least, the question of jobs, uh, just like any job in the India's informal economy, um, are underpaid, labor intensive, precarious, and tied to a perpetual cycle of insecurity. Uh, for the marine fishers, during the lockdown over the last two years, in fact, at this point in time, exactly two years ago, uh, it was very evident that migrant fishers, um, I live in the West Coast, I was in Goa during that time, there were very few avenues to find secure places in their work locations. Um, the situation further amplified by the fact that fishers' work and home spaces are on the boats and are at sea, and they have very little familiarity with the social, economic kind of settings that are on land of coast states. And so they are kind of doubly alienated. One is migrant workers, um, of all, as all workers were, and kind of doubly alienated because of the nature of work which is out at sea. Um, the impact of the brackish water fisheries sector, uh, now there is, given its revenue potential, as I said, about 30,000 crores, continues to be a huge export potential and growth in this, and it's expected even more over the next kind of decade. Uh, there's a huge amount of state support for the kind of shrimp sector because of the foreign exchange that it generates. Um, I'll target two kind of brief impacts that I observe in my work. Uh, the first is that the sector is often considered to be an avenue to revive the fate of farmers who are struggling in surviving on rice farming. 
Uh, the largest amount of land that is under shrimp cultivation today is on lands that were former rice bark baskets in coastal regions. Uh, my own research in West Bengal um, shows a slightly different picture to the one presented most popularly. Shrimp farming has, until recently, not been a steady process. Uh, even most farmers today will refer to it as jua um, or gamble. Um, intensive shrimp farming is extremely susceptible to diseases on one hand and to price collapses on the other. This is one of the reasons that institutional finance in the sector is limited. Most farmers rely on informal credit networks on high interest rate loans from money lenders or rely on local agents of equipment and feed and seed to supply them with material on credit basis, um, again at high interest rates, to be repaid when the crop is harvested. This places an immense pressure on the farmer on both sides of the farm gate. If the crop reaches maturity, a margin of profit can be made, though this can just as quickly disappear should a crop maturity not be reached. While the situation is changing today, the risks remain as banks and formal credit institutions stay away from lending. Um, the second, again, is that shrimp on harvest is extremely perishable. And the perishability means that once the shrimp is harvested, it cannot be left in the pond for too long. Because as they grow, if they are not harvested, the risk is too much to be able to keep growing them. They have to be harvested. Once they are harvested, the farmers have very little in terms of cold storage capacities. And so the price and the pressure is often dictated by actors who act as agents for larger processors and exporters or for local agents who are able to kind of use uh, capital from other places to be able to undertake this on the farmer. So there's a constant kind of squeeze on higher input prices, but a pressure on lower output prices. And this is quite common across other areas as well. Um, and the second is that, you know, shrimp farms are extremely intensive on the surrounding environment. They require fresh water and therefore extract a lot of groundwater. The seepage of saline water into neighboring lands make them barren. The ingress and ingress of seawater places a huge load on the near coastal waters and affects the ecology immensely. Now, the coast is a dynamic ecosystem which relies on the relationship between the land and the sea. And certain activities like shrimp farming do have a deleterious impact on the ecosystem. What is even more alarming is that most of the shrimp activities, like hatcheries um, or farms or processing units, operate outside of the legal purview of coastal regulations. Um, as the image on the right shows, this was an RTI that was filed by an organization in Tamil Nadu asking the Tamil Nadu state's coastal zone management authority, which is issues permits for development on in coastal areas, whether any of the hatcheries, any of the farms, any of the processing plants had any kind of CRZ, the coastal regulation zone clearance. The response to this RTI is no to every single one of them. Now, this is not by accident uh, where that all farms are operating out of uh, legal uh, overview. Um, this is part of kind of a googly, which was delivered back in 2005 in response to a Supreme Court judgment where all shrimp farms had been banned in a judgment in 1996. And soon after, a new kind of regulation was introduced that overcame the restrictions placed by environmental regulations. So that each time an RTI of this nature is filed and then, you know, somebody goes to the NGD to be able to try and hold the CRZ as an instrument to say, you know, this is the regulation, there is no clearance, therefore you are in violation of the CRZ. The Act comes back and says, well, that's a regulation, this is an Act that supersedes the environmental regulation. And so almost all shrimp farms remain operating legally, but outside of legality to some degree. Um, and there is little information otherwise on the conditions of work in shrimp hatcheries, farms and processing units. But if reports from other parts of the world are to be used as a benchmark to gauge the pressures of work in this globally competitive industry, it is clear that working conditions are far from decent. The migrated, migration data that we looked at in the last slide is also as a result of this form of development. Uh, coastal ecologies have been immensely degraded along with trawlers at sea that cause fishers to migrate out from their existing occupations. Back in 1995, the kind of fishers of West Bengal used to have a Bengali uh, um, slogan, 
which used to translate to saying that trawler owners and shrimp farmers are brothers. They want to hang themselves with the same noose. Um, and I would say 25 years later, that is just as, if not much more kind of visible, if one is to visit the coastside and see what the situation of a lot of the fishing villages are with this kind of intensive development on both sides. Uh, moving on. Now, the, given the scale of different geographies and water bodies that is under this form of development, it would be impossible to give an overview of the whole sector. Nonetheless, uh, some points can be covered. Um, it is important to recognize that culture-based fisheries and common water bodies like dams and reservoirs are themselves an outcome of the decline of capture-based fisheries uh, and point somehow to the already diminished state of water bodies. Freshwater bodies simultaneously act as sources of fresh water to other industries and agriculture, but they're also big uh, receivers of waste from these industries, and they're often most obstructed in the construction of dams and parages and are diverted through projects such as canals and interlinking. And so the presence of uh, capture fisheries and culture fisheries in large common water bodies already reflect the past that has displacement of people and the ecology built into it. Fishers in these water bodies do not have clear property titles and are regularly edged out by other actors as these water bodies become sites of development. The most recent policy on fisheries in the countries cited freshwater fishers as having the highest rate of outmigration. Like marine fishers without control over the water bodies, the state's kind of eminent domain often acts as a tool of displacement. As intensive forms of culture fisheries get introduced in these water bodies, states are taking over their management and leasing them out to private parties. The rise in the annual auction rates are unaffordable to local fishers, while simultaneously the private properties introduce other migrant workers, leading to an outmigration and a complete loss over local occupations and livelihoods. Now, as freshwater fishing and farming intensifies, there are concerns that this would cause large-scale depletion of groundwater in larger farms, given the vast amounts of water that artificially created freshwater bodies require, such as the 300-acre farm that are being developed in West Bengal that I referred to earlier. Um, the river that runs past these farms is completely dry, since all the water from the river is now in the ponds, and the whole area kilometer after kilometer after kilometer looks like a wetland. Um, this form of production is also said to decrease the quality and nutritional value of fish since the growth time is accelerated, anti-lice and antibacterial medications are given to maintain high levels of stocking, and pelletized feed, which due to price constraints might not be as nutritionally uh, secure or ind indigenously developed feed, often uh, provides much better nutrition to the fish. And finally, even where small fishers continue to fish in water bodies that are stocked by the state, the returns to fish are often too low to sustain the livelihoods. The squeeze can often be in the form of informal mechanisms, such as the panidari system, which proliferates. Fishers have to pay a large sum of their income to access water bodies, much like the zamindari system. Or as this slide shows, uh, the state often sets acquisition and purchasing prices so low uh, for example, in Madhya Pradesh, it has said 28 rupees for a katla over five, five kilos in size per kg, when we know that a katla in the market can be up to 140, 150 rupees. So there is a huge squeeze on the farmer, sometimes through official state regulation as well, other times through informal private players who have taken the lease over large water bodies. And there is an immense amount of squeeze on people who actually do the act of fishing. Um, now, whether, whether one is a proponent of the free market or advocates against it, I think one thing that has challenged all of us is the ecological and the climate crisis. Uh, in whatever transition we want to undertake to, to look ahead, we have to change the way things have been. Uh, you know, the last slide, uh, I just want to dwell on some points that I have before opening this up for discussion. Uh, first and foremost, the state of the ecology of fisheries in India is not in a good state. Ask any fisher on the change that they have seen in the last 20 years, and the response will invariably be one of decline. 
uh, check the parameters of any water body and it will undoubtedly be more polluted, more nutrient loaded and less naturally productive than it was previously. And as it dawns upon us, the success of Indian fishery story, uh, it also is simultaneously a story of struggle where fishers have actively participated and changed the course of the sector. Uh, now, fishers uh, have sustained struggles uh, for about 70 years, right, since me mechanization policies started. And it, if it was not for broad-based people's movements getting onto the streets, taking on the states, lobbying their parliamentarians, we would not have had even the regulations that we have currently. Uh, so, you know, this is just to say that there is a history of struggle. The state's path has not been uncontested. But increasingly, these forms of, of, of responses are getting diminished under the state of where we are at in India. So I just want to quickly make five points before I wind up. One is that, you know, we need to keep and recognize a key principle that is that without people uh, and people in connection to the social ecology, a transformation of Indian fisheries or of the ecology is not possible. And I say this because a lot of environmentalism around fisheries is tied to taking people out of water bodies and protecting uh, water bodies without people accessing them. I think this needs to change to some degree, given the kind of uniqueness of fish production in India. So five points really quickly. One, we need a democratic engagement. We are at an all time low in the engagement between the state and the people in the arena of policy making. The pandemic has further alienated people, and this process has dramatically reduced the democratic space for expressing dissent and for changing policies so they're more suited for the people. We have to continuously push to reclaim this space. The second is that, that there is a dilution of safeguards from policies to laws and management to regulation. We are seeing a rollback of safeguards that help fishers secure their livelihoods. The removal of, uh, no, I'm just going to stop and finish this. Uh, the removal of welfare measures, the intensification in the scale of investment, the changes to environmental protection regulation are placing people and ecologies at risk. There is a need to push back against these tips through a broad-based coalition and support for fishers' movement. Inclusion in policy is the third area of work. From land titles to work context, from kind of migration to working conditions, fishers find themselves excluded from the ambit of existing policies. These include labor-related codes, laws related to safety, accident and life insurance policies, lack of revenue titles. Current policies do not account for the landless nature of most fishers and kind of exclude them in securing capital required for new schemes. Um, this is fast exacerbating their decline. This becomes the third area of inclusion. The fourth is research. There is very little data on the manner of migration, working conditions, labor relations, household incomes, and debt conditions for fishers. A concentrated effort related to research in different areas that affect fishers has to be undertaken. And finally, who is benefiting? Uh, this is related to my current work uh, because we know very little about the firms, the actors, and the companies who are investing and profiting in seafood production in India. It is not all the Indian state. It is not all the fishers. It is not all transnational corporations. There's a wide diversity of actors, right from landed farmers to boat owner operators to merchants to corporations who operate in a whole different range of ways to make the sector what it is today, the fastest growing seafood and food sector in the world. I think without understanding who is doing what and who is they are doing it to, we risk a misanalysis of the sector and therefore policy prescriptions that result from this. And with these five points, I bring my presentation to a close. Um, I've spoken for a long time, and I hope it has been insightful to some degree. Um, and I look forward to comments, questions, as well as guidance and reflections um, on this realm of work. So thank you. Thank you, Siddharth. That is a very extensive talk covering, uh, as it were, the history of uh, fisheries development, if you can call that, from the early 1950s. You know, from seafood expansion to shrimp trawling, aquaculture, a whole range of issues. And then you end up with a kind of menu of five things that we should be looking at. Uh, before we get into that, um, one point, you know, a striking uh, number you gave during your talk that today 
uh, only 2% of um, either 2% of fisheries or 2% of fish workers are in the artisanal artisanal sector um uh, having recognized that uh, i wonder whether the question is not so much whether we can return to the era of um, non mechanized uh, fisheries uh, i'm not saying that you know we must accept the march of technology etc but we do know that many of those uh, artisanal fishers are now using mechanized boats right so is the issue then of how using these mechanized uh, boats as they go further and further into fishing grounds uh, how do we organize a sustainable form of uh, fishing um and you're taking up to one of your last points that you know your uh, denial of what uh, ecologists say that look remove the uh, fishers to improve the health of the oceans we we won't uh, uh, kind of accept that but how do we work with the formerly artisanal fishers who are still earning very very low incomes but using mechanized boats how do we organize sustainable fisheries are there cooperatives are there collectives are there movements on the ground which work in this uh, direction yeah uh, thanks for that yeah. ram uh, you know so there at the union very often um you know, two months ago there was a new marine fisheries policy coming in and we were in interaction with the uh kind of uh, department of fisheries in new delhi um and i think one of the points that we were trying to make is that the policy kind of refuses to start from a point of accepting where we are at both with the social and the ecological conditions of seafood production and so for example the bills and the policies continue to reflect this idea that there is an untapped potential we just need to do a little bit better to be able to get at them and for a lot of fishers the response is that we've tried that like whether we are continue to be artisanal fishers or we've managed to take credit and become mechanized boat owners there is no fish that is left in the sea to be able to keep pushing outwards unless we continue to have massive subsidies that allow for construction and operation costs to be met and at the same time we subsidize labor costs and operating costs to be able to get whatever little margin is left so i think one starting point is like okay we have a problem what do we do with that i think that would be a good starting point the second point therefore as an example for the unions at least speak about and i work with a couple of national federations of unions which is by no means completely representative of the fishery sector but there are two points i think which are relevant one is that there is technology from below and then there is technology from above and so unless we get fishers into tapping into their traditional wisdom and their understanding of the sea in developing technology from below we are going to be stuck in this cycle of technologies that are not suited to the socio ecology so i think one is we have to move away from that the second is that you know we've had 75 years of this let's set a 15 20 year window to phase out and change things because anything that is done immediately like a sledge hammer coming down um has an impact that one cannot foresee and so the other thing i would say is to let's try and have that longer arc of time to be able to change where we are at because that has come here over 75 years it's not going to go away in one lot and i think the third point that i would make to that is for example what are we doing with our food systems who are we producing food for uh when we have kind of one of the world's largest share of nutritionally insecure people uh there is prawn production on one side which takes fish that could be going to people or land that could be used to produce fish for people that becomes an export commodity and it's not that americans are nutritionally insecure or the europeans are nutritionally insecure but no matter where you go shrimp is just available now as a cheap kind of commodity and that comes off the hunger and the environmental degradation of a lot of other people so what fish we produce i think we need to think about that and the second thing is that marine fisheries as well you know a lot of mechanized boats today land high value species like sardines which get turned up into fish meal and fish oil and go to higher value fisheries like salmon eat a lot of uh, sardines 
But sardines as pelagic foraging fish have the least amount of carbon impact and they perhaps are the most nutritionally secure for people. So we're also producing fish for fish and for chicken and not fish for people. So I think there needs to be a significant shift in how we think about food as well and not just say, okay, this is what the market demands. This is what we are going to do. There has to be that kind of intervention that happens. And I think some of those steps would at least start moving things in the right direction so that then we have a chance to generate more of where the right direction lies. But I think setting the needle in the right direction has to start from some of these points. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I have a question here. This is on the uh, effect of climate change. And uh, you also said that maybe what we should think about is what we should do after 20 years. Will, uh, then are you suggesting that for the next 15, 20 years, instead of the rhetoric that we should double our seafood production, actually we should halve it so that it's more sustainable? You know, I think like very often in the carbon conversation, um, we don't have a conversation that goes on to talk about demand. Or if it does, the demand very often is a north-south divide. Like America should reduce its inputs. EU should reduce its demands, which is absolutely a correct call. But I think there's also some domestic aspects of demand that we need to start speaking about. For example, uh, how many of us know that India's fisheries can produce about three, four hundred kind of varieties, many more of edible fish. And these are part of diets of people, seasonally variant, cook, you know, different nutrition given to different people for different reasons. So our connection as urban consumers to seafood and the demand we place on pomfret, you know, a pomfret is of all different kinds of sizes, but we always like to see a pomfret that sits on a quarter plate, nicely tandoori and cooked, because food is also so much more than just food. It's this kind of political, social, cultural construct that we imbibe in different ways. And demand is tied to some of those things. So I think we need to have a conversation about where it is, both north side and within national boundaries. And the other thing really is like, I mean, we can't do anything about carbon unless the ocean is functioning or any water body is functioning, which means that there is upwelling of currents. There is a daily south and north up and down migration of fish species that actually sequester the carbon and take them down, that we have whales who dive and eat this fish and then defecate and then nutritionalize the water again. So there is a cycle of the oceans without people that requires to function for carbon sequestration to happen. So I think unless we again went back to the point that you know we need the ecologies to function as naturally as possible and that just having a water body doesn't mean we're going to have carbon sequestration. I think that's an important point, which means moving again food systems towards link to the former answer. And demand, I think, both nationally and globally has to be looked at. I think it, demand and has almost quadrupled uh, in some parts of Northern Europe and in America. Uh, but demand has also for urban consumers increased a lot. And whose food that comes from, I think there needs to be a broader conversation on that to be able to shift things. Um, so that there are a number of questions. Uh, some of them uh, reiterate uh, what you have said, but still, uh, let me ask uh, some of them. Um, uh, one is uh, talking about uh, something that Shashi Tharoor apparently mentioned in Parliament when talking about the impact of the cyclone Okchi. He said the western West Coast waters are overfished, and fishermen now have to go further and further for the normal limit. Now, how does India tackle overfishing and what are the implications? I mean, this question is really about your talk itself. So maybe, you know, you could uh, uh, respond with uh, some, a kind of focused uh, co comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, like, how do you tackle overfishing while keeping people in mind? People being not just the consumers, but also the workers in the uh, fisheries yep. uh, sector. Um, so I think I'm going to go back to my first answer and just reiterate those points for people to remind. But I think one of the things also that I spoke about in my talk is that there is an inequality in the sector in itself. And for example, uh, the mechanized fishing sector, which, um, and, and you've rightly said, Ram, I think there is no corporation as such in the marine fisheries sector, almost globally. 
And that is because marine fisheries come with their particular dynamic where large amount of concentration of capital from and land doesn't allow for the same kind of uh, at sea. It's a lot more diffused and competitive than a lot of land-based sectors. Um, so I think fisheries do have a lot of former artisanal and mechanized fishers who have become boat owners. But I think there's one point that, again, I've mentioned, which is under research, is that where are the investments in marine fisheries really coming from? And while we have kind of the rural credit markets, the rice markets of West Bengal, there's a lot of research that has happened on how credit circulates in these markets. There's very little understanding of actually how credit and money circulates in the marine fishery sector. So yes, the boat might be registered to a mechanized fishing sector, but very often their advances come from a trader who is trading ribbon fish, let's say, out of Veraval to a Chinese importer and will forward the credit that allows for the fisher to fish. And that kind of credit mechanism ties up into a certain kind of competitive dynamic, which leads to this intense competition to continue to overfish as well. And those are compulsions of the market that I think need to be changed through better institutional finance, better contribution when Oki happens. You know, the West and East Coast have begun to see, for example, just as in uh, what has happened, I think two years ago, Kerala had only 180 days of fishing of 365 days because high wind, weather and storms disrupted close to 160 days of fishing over one annual year, which means that fishers who used to have 330 days to fish are now trying to have that same livelihood in 180 days. And what that means is the 180 days become high pressure days, which is putting more pressure out to sea because there are no compensatory mechanisms for livelihood support when you can't fish. And this ratio is going higher and higher. So I think there is some amount of intervention that has to happen over there to a degree. Uh, the second is that there is a concentration in the mechanized fleet where about uh, 40, 25 to 30 percent of the boats catch 80 percent of the catch. And here what happens is that the boat owner, tied with wherever the capital from land or from institutional finance is coming from, takes about 60% of the share. And the rest of the 11 to 15 to 20 workers are left with 40% of the share. And that means that the, each one's share actually as a worker on a mechanized boat is a lot lesser. Um, and, so, and, and then you have the ecological decline because of the use of these gears happening in a way. So at least from the union's perspective, one of the perspectives is to shift away from mechanized fishing to relatively more benign and less impactful kind of gears where shared ownership of fishing boats, uh, seasonal variation in fishing gears do not cause the same kind of impact that is happening with marine fisheries and actually allow for some of the older fish stocks to come back because science says that fish is available, overfishing is happening, but it's also a composition where fish have shifted one, you have high value sardines that go for export or for feeding other fish. And then you have really low value fish that get fed to broiler chickens and other fish. So I think like we have to bridge those two extremes and bring back kinds of fishing and targets with fishing gear adaptation that allow for more cooperative kind of fishing means as opposed to this competition um, between states and between boats as well. And this is a phenomenon that is represented globally. The horizontal competition for a fish stock between boats, and then the kind of vertical competition between traders and the boat owners, the boaters and the workers. I mean, there is an inherent competition that is built into that. And overfishing, I don't think, can be saved or can be prevented while we live in this kind of model uh, by putting away enclosures. So bringing in people is really like, let's shift policy in another direction. The question here, which is that uh, India is one of the largest shrimp farmers. So illegal shrimp farming has been causing some stress for non-shrimp fishermen. For instance, it talks about Chika Lake. So the question is asking is, is there a shrimp mafia? I mean, so, uh, so Chilka Lake, at least, the, the, the word shrimp mafia has been used quite a lot. And the reason for this is, you know, with liberalization, as I said, in the late 90s, Chilka Lake came under shrimp development, where it was largely uh, using existing berries, so building enclosures in the shallower parts of Chilka Lake and being able to stock the black tiger prawns to be able to grow and harvest them. Um, at that point in time, the Odisha government had involved Tata uh, to come in and start this big corporate shrimp park 
off the coast of Chilka Lake, I mean, of the lakes kind of, and accessing the lake's waters. And there was a huge amount of action that had happened that actually stalled Tata from continuing with that project. But at some point after 2009-10, local actors kind of seeing the amount of revenue availability that is there, continued to illegally expand a lot of these berries um, in Chilika Lake. And in common parlance, they are very often spoken about as the shrimp mafia because uh, they would operate both. They were operating outside the legal ambit because Chilka Lake specifically was part of the 1996 Supreme Court order asking for the demolition of all shrimp farms in Lake Pulikat and Lake Chilika. And then it had also extended that to 1,000 meters from the high tide line for no shrimp farms. So, you know, there was a big move, to, but they were operating completely outside the legal purview. And so that mafia has aspects of control, of power, of some amounts of violence or displacement tied into it. Interestingly, however, um, currently Chilka Lake is seeing a lot of these illegal dairies being demolished. And a lot of that has actually come from ecotourism pressure which is to say Chilka Lake has value in much more than fishing and it should not be destroyed. And so now you have orders from the district magistrate um, continuously asking for gheris to be demolished. So I don't know where it's going to go because obviously there will again be a response from there. But the other reason why Chilka's demand has fallen is because, as I said, in 2009, when Pacific White Shrimp replaced Black Tiger Prawn, the productivity has skyrocketed, like in Andhra Pradesh, it's about eight times the productivity on each hectare of Pacific shrimp compared to Indian prawn. And so Indian prawn, which is largely grown in Chilka Lake, um, it's hard for it to be competitive to the same degree with the other shrimp. And slowly that market is dying out as well. So one would see that in, in I don't think it would last out and be part of the boom in the coming years. Um, so that there are a couple of uh, technical questions. Um... First, there's one about uh, your thoughts on the increased salinity of the soil, that there is uh, international soil and water conservation research, which talks about imbalance between incoming and outgoing salt that has resulted in salinization of soils. And now while, while some people see this as an opportunity for brackish water shrimp cultivation, especially in Uttar Pradesh, uh, what do you think this is feasible? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I'm going to... I think the person's question gives an indication that they understand soil a lot more than me. So I won't go into that, but I will definitely say that, as I said in the national policies, salinized and alkaline laden soils have become avenues to grow shrimp production. And so Haryana and Punjab, if you read their kind of state fisheries department documents, you do see already that they are talking about shrimp cultivation to some degree. Uh, my personal thoughts on this are. Uh, are that shrimp farms exist on the east coast of India and in rice farms or former rice baskets because that ecology provides something of a free subsidy to those farms. You don't have to put a pump to pull in water. You don't have to put a pump or piping to pull out water. You are at in a soil that is already uh, fitted for being able to retain water. It's a very clay marine brackish soil. So it can have it has good retention of water. Its alkaline limits are good, and shrimp farms, you know, usually are one thousand square meters um, and have a depth of about two meters, so roughly two thousand meter cube, and they require replacement of water twice a year, um, um, with each cycle every two and a half months, and there's a lot of those farms along the coastline, and there's a reason why. They are along estuarine regions because the tidal flow of water allows for these cheap inputs to happen without large-scale infrastructure. I would think that if coastal areas, uh, I would think that if states like UP Punjab had to start growing shrimp, they would have to provide for all of this, which would mean that they would have to provide, you know, tarpaulins and lining inside of ponds to be able to retain the water. They would have to create a saline freshwater mix that would be extremely intensive on groundwater, but it would also require effluent treatment. You know, here the effluents just go out with the tide into the ocean. It's a problem and it's a huge problem, but it allows for the industry to function. Where would the water from UP and Punjab and Haryana go 
into most likely common rivers and canal systems causing extensive so i think unless if there was a move for stronger environmental regulation i don't think they would be competitive in the global market for shrimp compared to the coastal states if 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 they were not given big subsidies through state provision to be able to undertake these additional costs they would not be competitive so if we see a growth happening i think we'd have to look out for where is the environmental regulation on this and where is the government support on this that is allowing for them to function and both of those would be tied to uh, to to these two things that i spoke about so it's happening how much it will happen to i think again we'll have to wait and watch in one of the last slides you did mention that uh, one of the solutions you have is to ban foreign fleet uh, how feasible is this i mean if we want india to export want our fish exports to go up, but we don't want them to come in is it a feasible solution you know this is one of the most contentious issues of indian fisheries but also globally i've just Uh, finished working with a group of people across the world on a publication for the FAO uh, that hopefully will be out sometime soon that looks at this aspect of foreign fishing in national waters and you know uh, this has been ongoing since the 60s um, and then the 70s where payments for development or 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 or, or payments made for accessing fish stocks have inherently been built into the way the ocean regulations work now india tried the same thing uh, though the justification in india has always been that foreign fleets coming in and a lot of other countries do this as well that foreign fleets coming in will allow us to get the technical expertise of management they will allow for ind- indigenous fishers to learn these kinds of fishing and over a 20 year period will transfer ownership to indian companies and allow for them to kind of take up this fishing but the experience globally on this has been very dismal while it is very often cloaked under these kind of like learning by doing kind of narratives uh, um, very often the competitive nature of foreign fleets in national waters very often more kind of powerful fleets in less powerful or unequal nations where enforcement management and regulation of fisheries becomes really hard and so usually they see an economic drain of fisheries resources away from the national incomes when foreign fleets come into waters not to say that they don't offer for example each country differs the pacific fisheries for example you know uh, some of the atolls are mere square kilometers in size but they have millions of square miles of ocean available to them and they have come together as a coalition for example in the northwest pacific so the southwest pacific to be able to get a lot of ground rent from foreign fleets and you know it has helped national development india situation is different we have close to about 3 to 4 million fishers who already can access these oceans we have a traditional fishing fleet that has always gone out and at least over the last 70 years has adapted it has never relied on foreign technology to come and teach people what needs to be done in fact foreign technology has come and it has been adapted by the fishers in their own way to be able to do this fishing so i think uh, the ban at the moment is in place uh, largely driven by this movement that you know we can do it you don't need to give these stocks off to foreign fleets because the returns never come shore side to uh, to the indian economy and so i think to that degree the justification is very diversified if it is tied with the shift in policy that i spoke about earlier which is a shift away from this current model of drive drop you know competition but also mechanize boats that whole shift i think phasing out of of foreign fishing boats fits into that model a little bit as well uh thank you so that uh, this is a hugely informative talk and we have never had a talk on uh, fisheries in on mantan before if i'm not mistaken uh, vikram in the past 15 years Um, no, something you know there's so much of neglect of this sector uh, it was very useful to hear you set out the scenarios set out possible solutions set out uh, you know where the tensions are and how perhaps we can uh, move forward uh, thank you very very much again and uh, i hope we will you will we'll have another opportunity and perhaps in person if ever you are in hyderabad and visiting yeah Um, definitely thanks so much to everyone at mantan and the audience and to both thank of you, you as well for moderating have yeah. a lovely day ahead thank you uh-
Thank you for um, waking up early in the morning for us. <laughs> no problem at all. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank, thank you again. And uh, our next talk will be an in-person talk on uh, April uh, 8th uh, by Mr. Syed Akbaruddin, who was uh, formerly in the IFS. He will talk about uh, connectivity in the new uh, global age. That would be on April 8th in person. And on April 10th, immediately afterwards, we will have a discussion with uh, Mr. Arun Shori on, the, on his new book, which has uh, just been uh, published. So please watch out for uh, notices on both these talks. This is on April 8th and April 10th. Vikram, you have... In Thank you very much. And uh, like Ram said, we hope to have you in Hyderabad in person. Those talks can be very interesting when you speak to a live audience. Thank you. Thank you.